Yeah, the interesting thing is always like, what are what are they talking about? You know, is, are they talking about what they just did and how cool that was and how excited they are, or are they turning to talk about what uh, what did they do on Fortnite or something? You know, so I mean, it's always different. And if they're excited about what they're doing, then you're in the right place. Then it's about you know how do we okay now how do we how do we control that? How do we find a place for it? I mean, I tell people that your, your class is like a bubbling pot. You know, it's like you, you, it's really hard to keep it at a simmer. And if it goes unwatched for a second, that pot boils over and there's a mess. You know, and some people, their classes are constantly boiling over. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Everything Band, a podcast that features conversations with composers, conductors, and performers of music for winds and percussion. My name is Mark Connor. I'm a composer and educator, and each week I have the great fortune to speak with and share the stories and wisdom of musicians and leaders in the band community. I'd like to acknowledge Vandercook College of Music for sponsoring this episode. With a world-class faculty, a location just minutes from downtown Chicago, and an intensive summers-only master's program, it's no wonder Vandercook College of Music has graduates teaching music in all 50 states 21 countries and six continents. Make next summer your most inspiring summer yet by pursuing a master's in music education at Vandercook College of Music. And for the next generation of music educators, Vandercook offers an exceptional, comprehensive four year Bachelor of Music Education program. Vandercook admissions information is available at www.vandercook.edu. Before we begin, I'd like to thank all of you for listening. I appreciate your time, and I hope that you are finding value from these interviews. I rely on word of mouth and social media to bring the show to new listeners. If you think you know one or two people who might find these interviews useful, please let them know about it. You can also help by following me and sharing posts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Remember, help students live up to the best that is in them through music. And now, on to this week's guest, Steve Graves. Hi, Steve. Hey, Mark. How you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for joining me tonight. My pleasure. So, Steve, you've been recommended to me by three separate people to be on the show. And you and I have never met. I taught in California. We were probably teaching there at the same time. But we've never yeah. met. But when this many people recommend someone, I think that's something to pay attention to. Well, it's humbling for sure. Can you um, introduce yourself to the listeners and tell them what you're doing? Um, sure. Um, I am a junior high band teacher. I live and teach in the city of Cyprus, which is in... Uh, Orange County. I'm about 15, 15 minutes from Disneyland near Long Beach. Um, I'm in my 18th year at my current school, Lexington Junior High School, uh, my 32nd year teaching junior high band. I live here in the community with uh, three kids, my wife and a dog. <laughs> and uh, I play in several local community bands, try to play regularly. And I also play regularly in a uh, rock funk soul horn band um, around here. Cool. So that's pretty much who I am, what I do. What's the name of the rock band that you play in? It's called, it's called City Beat and the Main Street Horns. Cool. They do a lot of like tap Tower of Power, Chicago, that kind of thing. That's cool. So 32 yeah. years teaching middle school band. Yep. So these are your people. The, these are my people. You know, initially I didn't plan on staying in middle school. I thought it would, it would just be a step in, but uh, it didn't take long to figure out this was a really great place to be. So, Steve, can you tell everyone your origin story, how you got started in music, and uh, maybe a little bit about those early years? Yeah. Uh, for me, it started out the same time my school kids start out. I started out in the seventh grade in junior high band, uh, Los Alisos Intermediate School, tiny little band room. And um, I really in- enjoyed just playing. And I got really excited after watching a local youth band um, and uh, really wanted to be a part of that. And that kind of really pushed me to to just play more. And I'm a percussionist, to, so to drum more. Um, and uh, the uh, my, my junior high director was very helpful in that he, he really let me take over a lot of things. My eighth grade year, I half the time taught the percussion class. Uh, and that was just super helpful. Uh, went to high school in Mission Viejo, Mission Viejo High School. And uh, during my freshman year, the band director, we had a new band director came in, uh, Mitch Fennell, who I uh, was just recently retired from Cal State Fullerton now as, as the director of bands there. But uh, he came in and was really uh, somebody who pushed us to, 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 to strive for playing more, um, being excellent, gave us a lot of challenges. So a high school band was um, a real fun experience. We had a great jazz program, so it got me involved in that. Uh, went, uh, went to Cal State Long Beach because there was a lot of people who were teachers and players coming out of there at the time. And I knew to, knew I wanted to do one or the other. Um, 
got a lot more playing experience working at Disneyland at about that time, played as a musician there for about 16 years, uh, played in the drum and bugle corps, Velvet Knights for three years, and met a lot of connections there. Um, so that's pretty much where my, my playing experience and, and things started from. So tell me about, um, that moment. I know you said that you were teaching your fellow middle school students when you were an eighth grader, but was that, when did you know that you were going to be a teacher? When was it like, I'm going to go into music as a profession. I'm going to teach it. You know, I, th- I was one of those folks that went into, went into college thinking I was just going to play. Um, but the experiences I had were, were so much more t- about teaching. And I was fortunate that in, in high school, I was the one who arranged the percussion music and wrote the drumline music and did copy work. And in college, I got to write and, and be the section leader. And those are things that, that really led me to, to think that, you know, I can, I can really work with people. I think more importantly uh, was getting experience coaching in other, other high school programs and junior high programs. I think during my college years, most years I was working with at least three different programs at once. Um, and just being a, getting a chance to, to come in as an instructor and be a fly on the wall in that many different band rooms, that many different band offices, um, hear that many conversations with band directors and students was really influential in knowing, you know, what to do and, and what not to do. Um, and watching that and, and watching some people who were very successful at it was really, I think, what led me to go, this is, this is what I really want to do. This is fun. And this is, and this is inspiring to me personally and, and to be um, in a position to inspire others, whether it's to continue in music or just to be a great person, um, to inspire others was really the thing that, that I see or saw that this is what music education can really be great in. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have any, any of those lessons from those conversations or from those times in those different band rooms? Do you, does anything stick out for you? Well, you know, I, th- I think the most important thing is, is when you're talking to kids to, to really listen. Uh, and listen to to what's going on with them and what do they really need beyond beyond what you're doing, and and to try and find out what's what's the what's their inner story first. Um, that's that's definitely a a big part of it um, is dealing with kids and dealing with parents the same way. Um, so many people I I read posts on Facebook groups and and in conversations that yeah, I have this issue with this parent and this issue with this parent and these parents always coming out about this and these kids and. A lot of it is just realizing and getting them to realize you're on their side um, and, and getting the conversation around to that point where they realize I'm on their side. I'm here for them. Uh, that's what I signed up to do. And once they realize that, um, a lot of pathways open up towards success. Yeah, it's it's interesting how a lot of teachers, or maybe it's a youthful thing, or or maybe it's just an experience. But a lot of teachers feel like education is a, is a kind of a us versus them, or a me versus them, me versus the students, me versus the parents. When in fact, it's really about pulling, rowing the boat together. It is. It is, and some of that just comes with life experience too. I know that my my attitude on that definitely changed as I had my own my own kids, my own family, and started to see things from the parenting side. Um, and that definitely gives you an advantage as a teacher is having that viewpoint. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think that the first time I noticed that I was teaching college and, and it, you know, it becomes like about us. What can we do to get better as opposed can, as opposed to like, what can I do to make you better? And it's something you try to share with your kids as well is that this is not about us. It's about uh, about me for me or you for you. It's about you and I for for everything else. What can you do? That's well, what me and my kids call is plus one, you know, do your thing plus one more thing because you just made it better for somebody else. Can you talk more about that? Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of our general philosophy about, you know, we have a mantra in our band class of great, great musicians come from great bands. In order to be a great band, we have to be a great class. In order to be a great class, we have to be great people. And therefore our first job every day is to be great people. And that goes that extends beyond doing what's good for us, but doing what's good for all of us. Um, and I think that's one of the great messages that, that music, um, especially being in a performing group, has for, for students and, you know, that, uh, of all ages, is that we have the ability in our daily actions with others to make life better for not just ourselves, but for them. And so going beyond what we expect to do, that plus one, I'm going to do what I need to do, plus one more thing. 
And I love that idea, that plus one that you're using. I'm going to steal that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and, and it, 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 it wasn't until I'd say probably about a year ago that I really realized um, that, that this, this, this whole teaching career is not about my desire to teach people to play instruments, but it had its genesis in high school years, hanging out at the beach late at night with the percussion section, probably doing things we shouldn't be doing, but just seeing everybody having such a great time and looking up at the stars and going, this is what I want to do. I want to inspire people to do great things, whether it's, whether it's teaching people to play the clarinet or whether it's teaching somebody to make really great jello salad, um, but to, to, to do something better with their lives and to do something better day to day with themselves, for themselves and for others. I think if you have that in mind, you can teach any subject. Yeah, you and I talked a little bit. I asked you a little bit of advice about some things I'm facing here with my fourth graders. And so you you obviously have a wealth of, of knowledge accumulated over over a long career. And so I'm wondering if maybe we can get into some of the some of these things, maybe a little bit, maybe we talk a little bit about classroom management. You talked about the idea of a class being a simmering pot. And I'm wondering if you could kind of expound on that for the listeners. Well, it it is, you know, and it, it, it depends on your, your classroom environment and your classroom culture. And and that in itself is a really important thing is what it, what the culture of your classroom is. When a student walks into your room, it should not be like every other classroom they walk in. There should be a, a, a set of expectations, a set of this is how we do things here that the kids are expected to live up to and that you live up to. Um, I think that's a really important part of establishing order in your classroom, that sense of expectation. Um, your daily rehearsals should have a, a sense of structure and pace. And to me, um, I, I like to keep everything at a simmer. I like to keep things moving. Um, but the thing is, is that kids um, have an interesting sense of momentum. Once you get them going, they are like that bubbling pot. And if you don't watch it or if you don't monitor it carefully, it boils over and just makes a mess. And so many rehearsals can go that way where suddenly you're in the heat of the moment and it all just boils over and it's noisy and loud. And, you know, sometimes that's OK. There, there are some wonderful bubbling pot moments that we've had where we've all just hit something that was a, a great discovery. It was an awesome moment or something just hilariously funny where we just couldn't go on for a second. And those moments are glorious. Um, but it's the distracting moments when when you're unable to keep things at a simmer because of your pacing or not realizing the heat in the room, how people are are getting antsy or excited. Um, that's what you really have to monitor to keep things at that simmer. So that that's the bubbling pot. And I guess the big question, what everyone would like to know is how do you do this? I mean, do you have any thoughts about the the hows of that? Um, well, lots of thoughts on the hows of that. Part, part of it is is realizing. I think part of it comes from sitting in the back of the room as a percussionist um, and, and having way too many hours of time with nothing to do uh, leads you to get into all kinds of things. And uh, so, you know, having that experience, I want all of my kids to be involved, um, which means you've, you've got to, you've got, you've got to spin plates. I, I don't know if you ever watched those old variety shows where the guy comes out with a stick and puts a plate on top of the stick and gets one plate spinning and he gets that one going and then he lets it alone and he goes and gets another one started. And then he lets that one alone, goes back to the first one, shakes a little bit, goes back, starts the third one, goes back to the second one, goes back. Pretty soon a guy's got like 17 plates spinning. But he's got to give them all a little attention to keep all those plates going at once. You know, and somewhere in the background is Cachaturi and Saber Dance. And he's got things going. And that's kind of the classroom environment I tend to have is to just making sure that I'm touching base with everybody in some way, whether it's eye contact whether it's asking them a question, whether it's asking them to, to, to uh, finger in what we call sizzle along while we're playing so that everybody is doing something and not spending a large percentage of the time um, a, dis, disattached, unattached to what we're doing. And I think that's the greatest thing. All right. And so we talked about these keeping these these pl plates spinning. And you mentioned that you spent a lot of time back in the percussion. And I know a lot of people struggle with their percussionists. How do you keep them busy when you're working with the winds on something? I think it starts out in for me in their beginning class because I, I, I separate them as beginners. I have a beginning percussion class that they, they've got to take a year of that before they're mixed into a regular band class. Um, that allows me to have a lot of structure with them. Uh, and give them a lot more discipline and keep them moving constantly at that pace. When they get mixed into 
to an ensemble then, they already have a lot of answers to questions they might have. They have a lot of knowledge about what they're going to do. Um, and I keep them playing a lot. Uh, it's okay, let's hear the low brass here and percussion. Uh, flutes, I need to hear you play this measure and percussion. And I need to, <laughs> so a lot of times you, you, you keep them playing, you keep them involved um, in a lot of different ways. Uh, I'll have the whole band learn their parts sometimes because often uh, in young band writing, the percussion parts are written a level or two harder rhythmically than what the rest of the band is doing. And so we'll all, we'll all learn the percussion part. Okay, everybody, hands on your laps. Let's put this on the board or, or up on the screen. And let's all learn how to count this rhythm. Let's all learn to play it. Let's play it along with the percussion. Okay, percussion play it. Everybody else drum with them. Did they do it right? Did they not do it right? Um, that's one way to do it. Um, I'll have them tummy drum a lot too if we're clapping and counting, if we're playing them. Uh, hands on their hands on their stomach and play their part there so the sticks are out of their hands my percussion class even if the kids have the sticks and we have a habit put the sticks out of your hands because if you're in your hands you're going to play that's why you took the class <laughs> i'm just thinking about my young i have a fourth grade drummer who he let's just say he's not really well engaged <laughs> yeah i'm going to have to move him up by the podium proximity is huge um you know and, and with beginners too so often i i, I see people standing on the podium doing one of two things, um, either beating out a pulse, which to me tells me, okay, but you haven't put a pulse in your kids yet. Uh, they, they, they really don't need a, a cowbell or even a doctor beat 90% of the time. Um, or they're, or they're conducting through hot cross buns and you know, you don't, your, your beginning band doesn't need a drum major. Uh, they, they need you walking around hearing what they're doing, walk, looking at hands, looking at finger position. Um, if, if they know where they're starting and where they're stopping, you really don't need to be on the podium. Yep, that's good advice. And so um, you talked about the idea of not having that. One of the things that I do in my class is I start with rhythm at the beginning of my, yeah. my classes and I start the metronome and I put it at, at about quarter note equals 80. And I let it run for, oh, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes of, of the, the class, just like it's as like, I'm as I'm teaching. So we'll do like long tones that I'll play, they'll, they'll play, and I'll do it with that metronome because I'm trying to get them to play four beats and not over or under. And it's like beating your head against a wall. It feels so good when you stop. It really does. But I found, you know, for me, and maybe it's just my inexperience with fourth graders, is that it keeps things moving, it keeps me it moving. It does. It does. Another thing you can try that, that I find, actually my kids play with better time, is when they listen to a, a beat, I'll, I'll use uh, any one of a number of your know, garage band or anything like that. And put a drum loop on. Oh. It's just a boom, 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 and they can keep time to that. They tend to not rush way less. They're, they tend to rush way less when they're just playing to a beat than when they're listening. Beep, 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 beep. <laughs> um, yeah. For some reason, I don't know if it's because of culture of what they're used to, or they just feel the groove more. Uh, and they find it more interesting and we vary the beat up. We try a couple of different ways. Sometimes it's kind of funny. We'll put on one that's really doesn't work or if it's just, you know, too complex or that they find is kind of groovy and, and get into more or less. And, uh, and that, but it gets them listening to a pulse. So that, that, that's another thing you could try too. It reminds me of those 80 synthesizers that had the beats on them. Oh, yeah. Remember? Oh, yeah. It'd be like Samba. Yeah. <laughs> Bossa right. Nova. Chicka-pooka, chicka-pooka, yeah, chicka-pooka, right. chicka-pooka, all those different things. <laughs> right, right. With those 8-bit kind of like yeah. digital sound. Even with my percussion class, a lot of times instead of pounding out a beat, I'll, I'll just – uh, I'll just I'll just give them a drum beat. I'll give them a, a bass drum and a snare drum beat with my feet in my hands or or anything, and they keep more solid time with that than with any metronome beat. How about articulation? You know, that's one of the things with beginners and and young young players. And I know it's one of the cornerstones of what we do. You know, with rhythm, articulation, embouchure. Uh, how do you teach articulation? What do you what do you do in there? there there's a a lot of different ways to go about it, but I think the key thing is is that we articulate on instruments very similar to the way we articulate when we speak. We're moving air and we're moving our tongue and we're moving our teeth. Um, have your kids try and talk without moving their tongue. That's always kind of interesting. Um, and they'll, they'll understand what terrible articulation sounds like or have them try to articulate without moving their teeth. Uh, they'll understand how, what terrible articulation is like. Have them try to talk without moving their teeth and they'll see, okay, I can't separate my words very well. And so learning to speak things and learning to use syllables um, and articulate our air that way, and then just remove the syllable, but try to duplicate that that motion of our teeth and teeth, lips, and and tongue and air uh, is helpful. Uh, understanding that air is a steady thing, and it's interrupted by by a tongue rather than started by a tongue. Um, we'll demonstrate with water sometimes. Put on a stream of water and interrupt it 
I'm fortunate I have a nice metal sink in my band room and I can turn on the water and you hear that stream. And if I flick my hand in the way of it, I can play any rhythm that they're playing and they hear how it's just barely flicked and interrupted rather than water on, off, on, off, on, off. And you, you play the rhythm that way and they laugh. They, they understand that it's kind of stupid to blow for each note rather than to just interrupt the flow. So many times too, the kids are thinking about fingers and not articulation, which is why it's, it's a good idea to teach articulation sometimes separately. Teach it on one note, teach it on a few different notes, and then apply it that same rhythm to changing notes because our, our beginners are just buried in that, that tactile um, reading and, 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 and the tactile experience of transferring it to notes that it's a lot of stuff to manage all at once. So I've been, we've been sort of nuts and bolts here and kind of in the weeds yeah. of teaching beginners. <laughs> and so we should probably get back to the sort of the bigger picture, which is more of what this podcast is. Yeah. And so I want to ask, you know, we know that you teach seventh grade beginners. Can you tell me about the rest of your program? What other kinds of bands you have at the school? And we're a seven, eight junior high. Um, our, our district's kind of funny that way in that we're a seven through 12 district. So, uh, most of the kids I get, 90% of the kids I get have not had any instrumental experience. Our tree tree district that feeds us. Uh, hasn't had an a instrumental program, and I'm excited that just this month they have finally invested and started that at all their schools, a five and six instrumental program for the very first time. And uh, I'm really excited and curious to see how it's going to impact my program. But some of the kids we get are, are fresh beginners, um, and we'll start most of them in seventh grade, some of them in eighth grade. Um, so I, I have three beginning win classes. Uh, during the day that vary from, they usually are anywhere from about 35 to 50 kids. Are they heterogeneous uh, have, or homogeneous? Uh-huh. They are, they're all mixed. Okay. All mixed in except for percussion, who I have in a separate percussion class. Um, that's uh, usually capped at 30. This year, I, I it's capped a little lower. So I have about 23 in that class um, that are that are beginners. Some of them on a second, their second instrument that they decided they wanted to also play in another group. Um, I have two second year groups, an intermediate band and an advanced band. And the intermediate class is mostly eighth graders and some seventh graders that have come in with some experience somewhere. And the advanced group is mostly eighth graders with a seventh grader or two. Uh, those groups are, are about uh, 55, 65 apiece. And so that's six periods of band a day. I'm just doing a little bit of quick math in my head. How many students in the school? Uh, our school has 1350 to 1400. Okay. So you have, I'm, if I'm right, you have somewhere around 300 students total. Yeah, it varies. Be anywhere between 250 to 300 in any given year. All right. So what are you doing in your program to attract those kind of numbers? What sort of excellence is happening, Steve? Well, I think one of the key things is, uh, getting, getting a community expectation or a, com a community, um, sense of sense of, Hey, there's this thing you can do kids. That's fun to do. Uh, that that's good to do. And that takes coordinating with the junior high, the high school and LA, any elementary program that's going on so that there's an awareness of, Hey, band is a thing. Uh, this is a great thing for your kids to do. Um, when I took over at the school I'm at right now, I took over a very broken program that was went through uh, about seven directors in two or three years. Uh, some of them just long-term subs. And, uh, and, and so there, there was not a great expectation in the community where in, Previous years, there, there probably had been. And so it took a few years to build that back up to where, hey, this is a fun thing to do. And that word of mouth travels down to the elementary school. Pretty soon you get siblings of kids who were already in the program or people who had friends in the program. Um, and that word of mouth is really the biggest thing to, to get people involved. How do you define your community? Well, it, it extends several ways. Your classroom is a community. You know, the kids come in and there's a culture of band. It's a band family. They know that it's a safe place. They know it's a productive place. They know it's a place that's good for them. That's kind of the same thing you want where you live. You want it to be a safe place. You want it to be a, a good place. You want it to be a place that's good for you, that you feel happy in, that serves you well. Um, and so we start there in the classroom, um, working with the parents of the kids. Um, I, I guess I get a little bit of cred because I'm right there with them. I've taught on the same soccer fields. Um, I've, I've, I've done some of the same community groups. I shop in the same store. I see what's going on in their town, uh, as well as serving their kids. So, uh, we're in this together as, as parents to do what's best for our kids and also to learn this weird thing called parenting and how to do that. So we extend beyond our, just the students to, to their families, to work together with them, to help them, uh, do what they're doing best. 
that extends into the community you live in. When families are trying to work together well, they're trying to work with their kids, then their kids are engaged, their kids are involved, their kids are safe. It makes your community more, um, it makes your community safer. It makes your community more involved with each other. People know each other. Um, and that makes for a greater sense of, of, of attachment. You know, um, I, I wish I said this, but I think it's Dr. Tim who said that, you know, band in, in a world of I, me, band is we, us. And that's essentially community. We, us. Have you ever commissioned any works or brought any composers in? You know, not until recently. Um, probably uh, several years ago, we did a, we had a composer come in uh, who just kind of offered out of the blue. And, he, and, and we played one of his pieces. He came in and worked, worked it uh, in one of our rehearsals. Um, and, and that was super fun. That was, uh, Daryl Johnson. I believe that we did a piece of his a while ago. Um, last year was the first year we really participated in uh, a consortium and that was with Randall Standridge and, uh, doing his, uh, his frogs work and, uh, March at Anacrids. And that was kind of cool because Randall did, uh, some YouTube segments as he was putting the piece together that we could show to the kids, um, as, as, as the piece was being developed from its very origins on a sketch pad of, I'd like to do a piece about this to where here's some themes, here's I'm orchestrating themes and the kids are starting to see their actual part being plugged into the score uh, as they got closer to the finished work. So that was really a, a rewarding experience for me and for the kids to, to see so much going on. This year, um, we just received a, a, a work that we're in a consortium with, with Tyler done by Tyler S. Grant, um, his Ash and Stone um, just received the, the the parts this week. So I'm really looking forward to digging into that. So what, what sort of value, now you talked about seeing the YouTube videos, but what value does that bring to the kids as far as their learning and their understanding of music, their engagement? You know, it, one of the things I try to do with the kids, and I think one of the things bringing a, a, a composer in who's developing a piece that they're a part of is it, it gets the kids thinking about the music and not the notes. They're, they're part of the process and they start to think about why is the music doing this here? Why is this doing this here? What is this music about? How is the music about this? And, and so it gets them thinking about the music more than the notes, really. And it also gives them something special when they, well, this piece was written for us or we're part of the group that was involved in this. It, it gives them a sense of ownership, um, which is a very cool thing because how many things in school are really their own. Like every time a school has approached me, that's been a good piece. It's just like there's something extra about it. You know, there's like a little, and I don't mean extra the way the kids use extra. I mean, like, yeah, there's some like, there's like a little bit of en extra energy in it that just. Well, I think it put, it puts a face to the performers, you know, even if you don't see their face, but you know that there's somebody expecting some, but something from you rather than a piece that you, um, th that you compose and then publish and hope people will buy. Yeah. Um, Sometimes and, and, it's sterile when I do that, you know. Uh huh. Uh huh. Because you're not making it specifically for somebody. I think. I, th I think that's. I, I I often will will write and arrange for my own groups. Um, part of my part of my uh, education experience growing up was writing and arranging for high school and percussion ensembles and drum lines and things. And uh, I still like to do that as much as I can for my own groups. And it's it makes it special because you're writing it with somebody specific in mind. It puts a face to notes. Yeah, absolutely. Do you do any marching with your junior high? We don't, um, fortunately. Um, and the, as close as we get to it is we have a, we have a competitive indoor drum line uh, that, that's part of our, our percussion curriculum. But that's as close as we get to it. Uh, next week, we'll go, we'll go with a high school band and we'll, we'll, we'll walk out on field with them. I won't say march because we'll just kind of try not to run into each other. And we'll walk out and stand, stand out there and play a couple things with them for pregame and sit in the stands. But that's about as close as my kids get to it. At this point, they're going to spend the next four years heavily involved in it. Yeah, absolutely. How many kids uh, go on to the high school band? Uh, we have uh, usually freshman class we send in is about 65, 70 kids. And so there's some attrition. So that band's probably 200. Yeah. In the neighborhood of. Uh huh. Yep. Big programs. Yeah. It's fun to see the kids move on. And and I, I, I stay involved with the high school program um, out of just wanting to stay involved. And in, well, in the recent years out of necessity, because my own, my own kid is playing in the band and I've had um, another one of mine go through the band. So I get to play band dad too. So the kids see me stay involved and, and they see that I'm kind of have a buy-in that way. So I think that's important to them too, but they see that it, I'm, I'm concerned about their six year music education, not just their two year. So Steve, how about 
any hard earned lessons that you learned in the early years or maybe even recent years that maybe you want to spare someone else from, from experiencing? Well, I think they're very general lessons. Um, the first one is, is to be kinder, to really, you know, approach each, each, uh, stressful thing, each run in with a kid, each behavior issue as just that it's a behavior. It is not the person. Uh, and to be able to separate what somebody is doing from who they are. Uh, if you can do that, it lets you handle things a lot kinder, a lot calmer, and with a lot less stress. Um, that's, that's, I think, the number one thing is, is learning to do that. I was very intense as a young director and as, as a young instructor and because I was very much about the product. And when you realize that the, that the product is people, not, not, not a show and not uh, a, a tune – uh, or a performance, when you realize that the product is people, then that's what you're more concerned about. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing I think is to listen and then listen more. What would you say to the band director who's in their first year and they're oh, about a month and a half, two months into their first year and things seem to be going off the rails? Um, the first thing I'd say is take a deep breath and take one thing at a time. Pick your battles. What's, what's the one thing you want to get done today? And if you get that done, celebrate and plan tomorrow. Um, and, and try to do 10% more each year with 10% less effort. But don't try to do all 90, don't try to do 90% more this year. <laughs> Baby steps, well-intentioned and plan. Yeah, I think, you know, from my perspective, having come back to teaching again the second time around with experience this time, with some gray hair and some time spent in other classrooms. It's really hard to resist the urge to try to do everything I know. It is. And, and the, the first program I started in, I inherit, inherited a, a pretty healthy program with a good culture of band. Um, and, and as I told you, when I took over this school, it was, it was a, a broken program with really no culture of band. And, and for me coming in, I, it was hard to resist n not trying to make, my other program at the new school right away. And I had to just take baby steps, um, insist on a culture, but okay, we're going to change this. And now we're going to change this, but you can't change everything at once, you know? Um, and, and you kind of have to approach your week that way too. You go in and go, man, I got a lot of stuff to do on Monday. I got a lot of stuff to do this, this week. Don't try to do it all on Monday. <laughs> spread, spread the love out and, and plan for that. You know, know what, what's, what's your, what's your limit. It's, 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 it's like when I'm doing yard work and, uh, I've, I've, I've learned that when the trash can is full, that's when I stop. If I keep working beyond that, it's a mess. Um, and things spill out and it's not productive and you kind of have to learn that too. What's, what, what's the size of your bin? Uh, when is it going to be full and, and work towards that each day. And when it's full, stop working. Yeah. Yeah. It's good advice. It's really is really good advice. Actually, when I think about it in application. I'm excited to announce the Everything Band podcast has joined forces with several other music education related podcasts to form the Music Teacher Development Podcast Network. The Muted Network provides support in the form of audio on demand programming designed by and for music educators. You can find more information about our network at mutedpodcasts.com. All right. And so, Steve, the first question I ask everyone is um, where do you draw the line between healthy and unhealthy competition in music? Um, healthy and unhealthy competition. I think, you know, when I see two kids working hard at lunch and after school, um, because they know that one of them is going to get a solo, that's, that's a healthy competition. That kind of peer pressure is pushing each other to get better because they're both going to get better as a result and they're both going to benefit. And they both know what the result is that they're both working hard and they're going to be better players. Um, that's healthy. Uh, when I watch marching bands practice long hours after school, evenings, weekends, I'm not always certain that they know what result they're trying to achieve. Um, it's certainly not a trophy. Um, I hope that it's, it's something along the lines of, of personal growth, excellence, um, a joy that comes not in the minutes spent competing, but in the hours spent rehearsing, riding buses, loading equipment, and, and hanging out together as well as, you know, perhaps some great musical memories. I think that, that the real value in competition is when you know what it is you're trying to achieve and when you've, you've made it something that is a planned experience for your kids. I want them to learn to do this, this, and this, 
And we're going to use competition as a motivator that the kids want to see how well can they do. Um, it's a lesson I, I took from, from my drum corps experience where we just went out to see how far could we max things out. How far could we push things? And if there was other people who maxed things out better than us, well, that's really cool too. Um, that was the, the competition we had was with ourself. And I think when a group goes out, if they realize how, how far did we take this and did we earn what we worked for, um, which was, was excellence and hearing, getting feed, the feedback we thought we were going to get and did we grow as performers and as people together, that's a great thing. Um, but man, you know, I don't think I remember any specific trophy or place I've won anywhere, but I sure remember the, the, the journey getting there and, and when it was worth it. And I think that if that's, um, inspired by competition, that that's healthy, um, when it makes us all better. But if just for the sake of, uh, trying to do better than somebody else, that, that's not healthy in life, you know? And, and so it's always trying to push, if it's about pushing yourself, towards a desired result, that's healthy. If it's about just trying to be better than somebody else, there's always going to be somebody better than you. How do you find work-life balance in a career as a music educator or as a musician? Well, I, I think part of it comes from thinking of, of not life and being a music teacher, but life as a music teacher. Um, a lot of people separate or, or really they, they say you need to separate your work from home. Um, I'm quite the opposite. My, I take my work home with me. I, I live what I do. Um, I live in the community that I teach in. And I think the key thing that works for me is to know when to leave work alone, when, when to be able to click it off. Some people say, never check your work email when you're at home or during the weekend. Well, for me, I find it makes me highly efficient. Uh, if I can answer somebody's question at 10 p.m., or midnight, as I've, I've, I've been prone to do, that's one less thing for me to do later on. Uh, that's a valuable and efficient thing for me. Can I answer that question and then go back to enjoying a ball game? Yeah. Some people can't do that. Um, they find that stressful. And so if that works for them, then that's really great. Um, being efficient, being able to get things done in the hours you are sitting at school frees you up, whether it's uh, answering emails, getting paperwork done, getting planning done. I know that in my band room right now, my plans for the week for next week are done on my whiteboard in my room is what we're doing on Monday on the grid is what every class is doing next week. I can forget about band for the next two days and walk in Monday morning and be completely prepared. And that is liberal. Um, and that helps me enjoy my family, enjoy what I do here at home. They also know that, that I'm passionate about what I do. And, and so they understand when, okay, I've got to sit down and, and write this out right now, or I've got to sit down and, and, and take care of this little bit of band business, or I'm going to go judge this show this weekend. Um, they, they understand that that's a part of, of, of me finding value in what I do, and, and they support that. On the other hand, I have to understand when it's too much. When my kids were younger uh, and involved in, in youth sports, I missed a lot of those extra um, band activities and judging and things like that so that I could coach baseball and softball teams and soccer teams. And I wouldn't exchange that for the world. So you have to realize what season of life you're in and where you want to put that time because time does not move backwards. And so you have to realize that you're never going to get back. And there's things that you can't put off till later. I'm, I'm gigging more now than I did when I was in my 30s. Um, because I have more time for that kind of thing and loving it. Um, but earlier on, I made the, made the choice to you know, not do as much of that. And, and for me, that's helped find that balance. What are the challenges as you see them facing music education or band? And how can we best meet them? Yeah, both sides of that are tough. Uh, well, I think the, the biggest challenge with, with music education in general is people appreciating art for art's sake. Um, and not, I mean, there's a lot of other ways you can rationalize the value of music education. You can talk about how it builds 21st century skills that are desirable right now, creativity, teamwork, problem solving, how it makes your math skills better, how it makes your language skills better, how it makes you a better communicator. And all of these are great things that, that we do hope our kids get. But when it comes down to it, the real value and the reason that, that arts is in education and should be in education 
is because it, art is what makes us more human. It's what connects us to the human experience. And to get people to realize that, that, that I could play, uh, you know, uh, mourning from Pierre Gant to somebody in any part of the world, in any culture, speaking any language, and they would reflect on it by describing a similar experience. They would all come up with ideas about what was going on and, and in a very similar way, having heard the piece for the first time, regardless of what their culture is, music reaches out to us as humans that way. And art reaches out to us that way. Um, and, and it's part of what makes us in touch with, with who and what we are. Um, and I think people have to realize that. Um, you have to get your students involved in it first that, that, to understand what the music is. Music is not the notes. Music is not rhythm. Music is not fingerings. It, it's, it's something that reaches beyond that. And ask them a lot of questions about that and get them to start thinking about that. You have to get their parents thinking about that. When their parents hear their children play something that's beautiful, their parents have to realize, why is that beautiful? Um, it, it's a product of perhaps a lot of hard work, but it's also because it's music, because they have created something that's not a block wall. It's not a piece of masonry. Um, it's, it's something that took that ch part of that child and part of who they are to make. And when parents understand that, it's, boy, it's beautiful. You know, that's what makes mama cry. And... Uh, and, and, and then they take that to the community. Then it becomes important. We need to have this in our community because it's part of what makes us who we are. Um, it's a lot like food. People tell me that everything eventually comes down to food with me. But, you know, not every culture has its own individual language, but every culture has its own individual music, just like they do cuisine. Um, and, and it's all got a little different, different spice to it, a little different taste to it. And that, that tells you something about those people. And music is like that, too. It's, it says something about who we are. And so your community has to value that. I think that's really what has to happen. Um, you have to make that publicly known. You have to advertise. You have to brand your program and what music really is in your community. I think this, the second biggest challenge is, is just monetary, is funding. If people think it's really important, then you need to get them to put their money where their mouth is. And that's, that's probably a challenge for every subject, but, but getting people to realize why music is important to us as human beings. Um, gosh, you know, when they realize why um, saving the environment, global warming, uh, recycling is important. Are they willing to put money towards it? Yeah. Well, this is probably as important as those things. And they need to realize that and put the money towards it. I don't know how to put it into words. I also think it's the, about the closest thing to magic that we have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If we actually, are, my kids, we refer to all the the, the, the non musicians as muggles. And you're building community by doing that. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite anecdotes is my wife is a is a cellist. She's a cello professor at Southern Illinois Edwardsville, and I just I just <laughs> doxed her, I guess. <laughs> but my <laughs> wife is a professional cellist, and she plays every yeah. summer with the Eastern Music Festival, which is a big music festival in North Carolina. It's conducted by Gerard Schwartz, and uh -huh. it's a terrific orchestra just a terrific orchestra. And so I took my son when he was four years old, they have a, they have a conducting workshop for, for young conductors. And so the conductors do a concert, um, one Sunday of the festival doing just nothing but overtures. Yeah. And I had my son and I don't think I'd ever brought him this close, but we were sitting in like the fourth row, kind of right by the first violins, kind of like midway down the section. Yeah. And my son at four years old is just fascinated. And he turns to me and he goes, it's like magic. And when you think about it from a child's <laughs> eyes, it really is because you have all these people, you know, he yeah. knows all the people on the stage because they, you know, he knows mommy's friends and then yeah. he sees them all do that. It's incredible when you think right. about it, when you really think about what we do, it's incredible. It, it, it really is. I mean, I'm at that point right now with my, with my beginners where they have enough under their fingers that we put a page of music in front of them and, and so I say, play this. And at first they, they stare at me and go, wait, what? And then we start and they play it and we finish it and we stand there and go, look, look, do you see what you just did? And they're like, yeah, that's, that's the magic. It's just beautiful that they're learning this language and putting it into something that can affect you um, emotionally. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's exciting. It is. Gives you something you can't get any other way. Absolutely. And I still get excited about it. So what advice would you give your younger self? Uh, my younger self? Well, it's similar to what, what advice I would give first year teachers. I would say be kinder and listen. Um, and and um, 
pay attention to what's going on around you. Um, be observant. Uh, we, we live in a bubble as, as music educators or whatever band program we're in. Um, and be aware of what's going on around you. Uh, I think I would have absorbed a lot more as my younger self if I was paying attention to things outside of my small kingdom and community. Uh, what's going on in, in other other band places? What are other ensembles doing? What are other people doing? That develop a sense of uh, the largeness of of the world, and that there's way more. There's many more ways to do things. There's so many more best ways to do things. There's no one best way to do things. And I think as a as a uh, younger person, that was it was just well, it's this way because this is the way I was taught. Uh, this is the way so-and-so said to do it. Um, and to just open your eyes out, up, up and use that as a starting place and to really see what's around you and, and how small each one of us is in this business as well as in the world and, and to try and absorb a lot more. A lot of people I see, I see starting out getting their, getting their master's. I, I waited way too long. I didn't get mine, finish getting mine until about three years ago. Um, but I see folks going into it with uh, a year of teaching under their belts, two years of teaching under their belts. Um, and, and, and they walk into a program and they're amazed what they don't know. And, and I'm not because you've only been doing this a couple of years, sometimes, uh, taking maybe five years to make a lot of mistakes and go, okay, here's where the holes in my knowledge base are. And then go into a program like that, uh, a master's program would be maybe a better idea. Um, but, but to absorb things, that's, that's what it's all about. All right, Steve. So I like this question a lot and it's not your favorite work but it's about a work that's really meaningful to you. And so if you had a choice, what would be the final work for wind ensemble or band or even orchestra or choir that you would conduct and why? Does it have to be just one piece? <laughs> well, that's hard. <laughs> well, that's yeah, hard. I mean, I can't let you list 20, but you know, you can give me two. If I had to narrow it down to one or two, I'd say perhaps Russian Christmas music, just because that's a piece I've just enjoyed every time I hear it. I've never heard it and gone... Yeah, I didn't need to hear that again. Um, or it could be Esprit de Corps by, by Jaeger. That's just a piece that I have some really great memories of playing and playing with some great friends um, that, that uh, just makes me feel good. Probably one of those two. All right, Steve, this was a, a terrific interview. How can people get in touch with you? Best way is, uh, uh, well, two ways. Um, I'm on Facebook constantly, according to my wife. Um, and uh, and also via email, best email to reach me at is uh, graves underscore s. That's my name, G R A V E S underscore s at a u h s t dot u s. Like I said, I check it constantly. All right, Steve. Well, thank you so very much for your time. Well, it's been a pleasure, man. Thanks for asking. 